Notice this example here in terms of probability. A man accompanied by a small boy entered a barber shop and he asked for a haircut. When the barber had finished with him, the man said, I'm going uh, next door for a beer while you cut the kid's hair. The barber gave the boy a haircut then waited for the man to return. Finally, he turned to the kid and asked, where in Pete's sake did your father go to? Oh, said the boy, that ain't my father. He's the man who stopped me in the street and asked me if I'd like to get a free haircut. <laughs> well, are you involved in these kinds of assumptions? Is your life based on inferences or facts? Which do you think your life is based on mostly? Huh? If you think about it, on inferences. And one of the reasons why we have so many communication problems, or problems generally, is because we act on inferences as if they were factual. As if they were factual. Make all the inferences you want. I am not saying that you should not make inferences. Your life, my life, our lives are lived primarily on the inferential level. But there's a difference in behaving on inferences as inferences compared to behaving on inferences as if they were factual. This is why we have misunderstandings. I communicate something to you, you are certain that you understand me. But in the problems of communication, you cannot orient in terms of certainty. You don't know really what I mean, right? In terms of probability. But if you are certain that you know what I mean, then you won't stop to ask me, what do I mean? You go off and do the job on your own, and that is not what I meant in the first place, only to lose thousands and thousands of dollars. If you would have asked me, is this what you meant? And if it weren't, then we could correct this misinterpretation, etc. Now, we will deal with that tomorrow. But notice how these two principles lead into the problems of communication. Number one, this automatic trigger-like reaction. Number two, jumping to conclusions leads toward all of the communication failures that we have in business and industry. Now, what are some conclusions for the fact-inference principle that we should concern ourselves with? Let us consider five important conclusions. Number one, basically, life is lived on the inferential level. Make all the inferences you want, but know that you are doing so. Know the difference between the two, between inferential statements and descriptive statements or statements of fact. Number two, check your inferences. Check your inferences more than you normally do. Number three, don't pass off inferences as if they were statements of fact. And also, the other side of the coin, don't accept others' inferences as if they were factual. Number four, don't act on inferences as if they were factual. Heretofore, we've been mostly talking about inferential statements. Now, notice the importance on the factual, nonverbal, behavioral level. Don't act on inferences as if they were factual. And finally, number five, orient your life in terms of the assumptions of probability, not the assumptions of certainty. Check your assumptions and be willing to say, in effect, I don't know. So far, we've been talking about two barriers to effective communication. The first barrier to effective communication was the signal reaction the tendency to respond automatically or too quickly. The second barrier to effective communication was jumping to conclusions or confusing our inferences with statements of fact. Now we come to the third barrier to effective communication or intelligent behavior. In general semantics, we call this the allness orientation, A-L-L-N-E-S-S. The assumption that we know it all, or the disease of psychological arteriosclerosis, a kind of hardening of the attitudes. This is the closed mind. And again, this is in the booklet of mine of the same title, The Closed Mind. Now, before I lecture on this, we have to ask questions scientifically. Why can't we know all about anything? Because I have to have some scientific proof 
for this particular statement. Why can't we know all about anything? In other words, let's put down some of the limiting factors of our acquaintance with things. All right? Why can't we know all about anything? Time. All right? We don't have that much time to analyze a particular problem or situation. We usually have only a second or two. We have a minute, an hour, day, etc. But there are time limitations. All right, any other uh, limitations? Let's say uh, intellect. Again, we can put quotes around this. Many of these are ambiguous. But intellectually, we forget so much on the conscious level, all right? Any other limitations? Change, good. And I will be talking about this, the importance of recognizing change. The world of reality changes, but sometime you and I have a static, non-changing orientation. Good. Uh, that's hard to write down. <laughs> But that's a very good question, precisely. We wouldn't know even if we did know all, which we probably can't. And this is why I say probably, right? The moment we are in the scientific area, we have to use such words as probably, I think, at this date, etc. Any others? All right, physical limitations or sense limitations, okay? Sense limitations. In other words, a bird or a dog, let's say, can hear a higher pitch than you and I. Uh, we need telescopes and microscopes as a kind of an added nervous system. Now, what we are talking about is this, you see. From any fact or nonverbal world of reality, all that you and I can do is to select some characteristics and eliminate others. This is called abstracting or to abstract. This means that no matter what we see, what we observe, we can only select some characteristics and we eliminate many more. Abstracting or to abstract means selecting some characteristics and eliminating others. The guy with the Jehovah complex acts as if he knows it all, as if he has abstracted everything. Do you know some people like that? But what we are pointing out here is that it is physically, humanly impossible to know all about anything. And this is one of the great barriers to effective communication. This is a, one of the great barriers in business and industry because, as I will point out, the allness orientation does not manifest itself only in the extreme form of dogmatic behavior. But I will point out, and we may as well write it in now, and I will talk about it later on also, it is so extremely subtle. That is the most important thing. It is so extremely subtle in all of us. All right, time limitations, intellect limitations, change, sense limitations, uh, let's say uh, interest. What interests you will not necessarily interest someone else. On the Athens, Texas golf course, a shapely miss, attired in the briefest of shorts, stepped up to the number one tee and prepared to address the ball. Three caddies and five male golfers stepped aside and watched. She swung prettily, hooked the ball, and lost sight of it. Could you tell me where my ball went, she asked the onlookers. Sheepish grins passed over eight faces. Not one of them had had his eye on the ball. Well, this is abstracting or selecting from your own point of view. Point of view. Any other limiting factors of our acquaintance with things? Yes. What's that? Environment. All right. According to our environment. 
All right, this is certainly very important. Environmental limitations. Any other? Culture. All right. Culture. Let's put down here for nine, language. The very tool that we are using in communication is tremendously limited, as we will see when we get into the areas of effective communication. Now, we can go on indefinitely and extend our list, but the most important thing is here that we have a tremendously large number of limiting factors of our acquaintance with things. All that you and I can do neurologically is to select some characteristics and eliminate others. Now, when we forget that we can only abstract some characteristics and eliminate others, then we fall victim to what we call the allness orientation. This is a person who thinks that they know it all, the closed mind, and what are some of the manifestations of the allness orientation. This is the refusal to listen. The refusal to listen. The refusal to learn. The refusal to change or keep up to date. The assumption that we know it all. Notice these, we're still talking about unconscious assumptions. The assumption that we know it all. This is the allness orientation. But again, the most important thing, it is that it is so extremely subtle. Somebody makes a statement to you, already you assume that you know what he means. Can you ever know what an individual means by listening to his first few words? Can you? Probably not. But do we too often assume that we know what they mean, and we cut them off. And this is, of course, why you have misunderstandings. Now, the opposite of the allness orientation is the non-allness orientation. The non-allness orientation. This is the person who realizes the limitations of his knowledge. This is the person who realizes the limitations of his knowledge. While the allness-oriented person makes a statement and puts a period or an exclamation point after it as if to say, this is it, the non-allness-oriented person, after his statement, there is an etc. An etc. And in fact, this is the device to overcome an allness orientation. If you can be conscious of two things. Number one, if you are conscious of abstracting, this means that you are conscious of selecting some characteristics and eliminating others. And if you are conscious of abstracting, you won't act as if you know it all. Right? I mean not only intellectually, but I mean in your ways of behaving. If you are conscious also of the etc. And one of the things, one of the devices I think that we have to do in business and in industry is to have little, you know, the little sign that says think. Well... I think that this is a pretty good idea to have little signs like this, etc., placed around an office to get rid of the closed mind, to get rid of the allness orientation, the kind of an allness orientation that is ever so subtle. And when your salesmen refuse to pick up the phone to make a call because they assume that the other person won't buy, is that an allness orientation? Isn't it? 
Aren't they assuming more knowledge than they really have? When we have misunderstandings and I fail to ask you, what do you mean? When I assume I know what you mean, this is an allness orientation. Ever so subtle, but it is there. And this is one of the main barriers in business, in industry, and in interpersonal relationship. The assumption of more knowledge than we really have. Let me show you how completely subtle the allness orientation is. A friend of mine who is a father of 12 volunteered to babysit one evening so his wife could have an evening's relaxation at the movies. Don't let a single one of them come downstairs, his wife instructed him as she went out. He promised to carry out orders to the letter. He had just settled down to a book when he heard steps on the stairway. Get back upstairs and stay there, he commanded sternly. He read in peace for a few minutes, then again heard soft footsteps. This time he added the threat of a spanking. Soon he again detected stealthy sounds and dashed out in time to see a small lad disappear up the top steps. He had hardly returned to his book when a neighbor came in distractedly. Oh, Fred, she wailed, I can't find my Willie anywhere. Have you seen him? Here I am, Ma, said a tearful voice from the top of the stairs. He won't let me go home. <laughs> well, notice how subtle that is. Assuming more knowledge than we really have. But when you do so, you don't ask questions. And when you don't ask questions, this is when you are in difficulty. Whether it's in the communication level, getting more information, etc. Write down the importance of asking questions. Because when you don't ask questions, this, you can be pretty well sure that you are afflicted even to a small degree with an allness orientation. If you want to have people to stop them from jumping to conclusions, just ask them one question. Ask them, how do you know? That'll stop them. But even more important yet, you and I should ask ourselves, how do I know? Where do we get our information from? If we're going to be factual, if our evaluations will fit the structure of the world of reality. All right, so remember the importance of this allness orientation. Put a label on a guy. Give him a title of MD, PhD, president of a company, vice president of a company, and something happens to his behavior. He does more talking and less listening, right? And we will talk about the importance of listening. This is one of the problems in business and industry. We have only one-way communication. We can put this down too. One-way communication. In business and industry, for example, by one-way communication, which way do we mean? Down only, from top down. And I've been a consultant to some companies with the president of a company was tremendously non-allness oriented, and so was the rest of the company. They had good two-way communication. They had communication top down. They also had communication going from bottom up. I've been consulting to other companies where the president was tremendously allness oriented. They only had, as you would suspect, one-way communication and a lot of other problems besides. This is why you have an awful lot of communication problems in the military, because probably there is mo no more autocratic or dictatorial organization than the military. And what one of our semantic scholars one of these days should do is to go through the literature of the Second World War, and you would find, unfortunately, how much time, money, and energy was wasted or lost because of communication problems. Is communication important in your job? Is it? Is communication important in your personal life for success? More so than we realize. And this is why I spend as much time as I do relative to communication and general semantics. 85, 90% of what you do on your job is in one way or another 
communication. Right? Asking questions, giving directives, evaluating, thinking, etc., etc. And most of us have not been taught the processes of effective communication, the way to evaluate properly in a scientific method. So remember the allness orientation. But the important thing is don't concentrate on the allness orientations in others. Because the moment you concentrate on the allness orientations in others, what happens? You forget about yourself. Wisdom begins at home. We all have to keep working on ourselves. So how do you get the non-allness orientation? Again, as I've said, one, become conscious of abstracting. Become conscious of abstracting. If you are conscious of abstracting, consciously, then you will realize that you cannot know all about anything. Number two, if you are conscious of the etc., no matter what you or anyone says, more can always be said. And in fact, this is the title of our Journal of General Semantics that Dr. Hayakawa is the editor of. It's called ETC, A Review of General Semantics. Korzybski liked the, the choice of this title because no matter what you find in the journal, more can always be said. Again, notice how very subtle these allness orientations are relative to an inferiority complex. Now, too many individuals, let's say they do have a physical disability, they lost an arm, let us say, but it's the easiest thing in the world for this disability to be maximized into other areas where they don't belong. The trouble with an individual, let's say, who has an inferiority complex. Is there anyone here who does not have an inferiority complex? We all do, psychologists say. There's nothing wrong with an inferiority complex. But the danger lies when it spills over into other areas where it doesn't belong. The man who lost an arm, who admits that he has lost an arm and accepts it, and who says, okay, I lost an arm, this is fine. But too often it spills over into other areas where the person will say, I am no good. Those are two different kinds of statements. I lost an arm and I am no good, period. So you and I have to keep working on ourselves to try to limit or delimit these allness orientations of inferiority complexes. Uh, Dr. Hammond of Northwestern University's guidance department tells of a young lady who informed him that she had an inferiority complex. He asked her to compare herself with four of her friends in each of their most common activities. The girl rated herself third best in dancing, second best in studying, first in swimming, and last in roller skating. He then defined an inferiority complex as feeling inferior to everyone in everything. The girl went out feeling quite relieved and perfectly normal. All right, where do we find this allness orientation in business and industry or in our interpersonal relations? How can you use this principle? Do you run into it every day? Or am I talking about something that is not applicable. Is this one of your problems? Do you see the allness orientation in yourself? Because the moment you can't, you're in trouble. That is a sure sign of allness. But again, the most important thing is this. It is so extremely subtle. The refusal to listen, the refusal to learn, the refusal to change or keep up to date, the refusal to delegate responsibility. Those of you who are in business or industry, you're going to kill yourself if you are managing a large corporation because problems just don't add up. Problems multiply in a geometric ratio. In a geometric ratio, or what we call an exponential function, each person who, whom you handle is not just one problem, but they intertwine, they intermix into many, many different problems. And so you must learn to delegate responsibility and the authority that goes with it. But the guy who thinks he can handle everything himself, 
And this is the autocratic executive that I was talking about last night. The world of business has changed tremendously compared to 40 years ago. 40 years ago when businesses were small, president of a company like Henry Ford, let us say, who started off and he had to do everything. And actually, as you know, they had to get rid of Henry Ford because he refused to change or keep up to date. Is that important in business and industry? The necessity of changing? Oh boy, is this ever. If you don't look for newer and better ways to run your company or do your job, your competition will. And you will be a second-class corporation within a year or two or less. That's how fast the world of reality is changing. All right? These are some of the variables involved in, in, with the allness orientation. Now, how can we keep working at ourselves? I think one of the things that you and I can continually tell ourselves is, I don't know. The allness-oriented person says, I know. Period, exclamation point. With this kind of a guy, learning stops. But with a non-allness orientation, when you and I are saying, I don't know, two words dangle on. Let's see. This is the motto of the scientific method. And if you want to solve your problems in your corporation, in your company, or in your personal relationships, you must say, I don't know, if you don't know. But the danger is when we don't know and we presume to have knowledge that we don't. Assuming knowledge that we do not have is the allness orientation. Now, what are some conclusions that we might consider relative to the allness, non-allness principle? Number one, we must realize that the allness orientation is so tremendously subtle it afflicts all of us in many different ways. Number two, we must be sure that in our talking and acting that we don't start the circle of allness. We learn it from others. They learn it from us in a kind of circular pattern. Number three, we can do a good deal of dissolving allness in others by A, assuming a non-allness orientation ourselves, and B, quietly, over a period of time, teaching them the principles. Now, why would we say quietly and over a period of time? Because you and I are not open to suggestion. We have made our own world of sanity out of this world of insanity, unsanity, change, and complexity. We are not open to change. We are not open to suggestion. So we do not want to use an allness orientation trying to change the allness orientation in others. Number four, we must realize that there is no necessary relationship between a person's education, intelligence, and his allness. We find the allness orientation among some MDs, PhDs, highly educated individuals, as well as individuals with little or no education. This seems to be a personal characteristic with some individuals, some more than others. Also, the negative mental attitude. Too often, again, we confuse cynicism, the skeptical negative mental attitude, with the scholarly attitude, and they are definitely not the same. This is the closed mind or the allness orientation. And finally, number five, we must realize ourselves and teach others to realize that this allness shows itself in, quotes, all degrees, in all variations, in all circumstances, but most importantly to realize in very subtle ways. Please turn the cassette over for the start of Side B at this point.
One of the major problems in business, industry, or on the personal level is the problem of misunderstanding. Many of us have misunderstandings when we communicate with other individuals or when they communicate with us, and there are reasons why we have misunderstandings due to certain false assumptions about the very language that we use. In order to point out why we have misunderstandings, let me give you this little quiz on why we have misunderstandings. Number from 1 through 19, and would you answer either yes or no? And I'm going to go quite quickly, as we do in ordinary, everyday communication. I'll read a list of 19 words, and do you know what or whom I mean when I say? For example, President Roosevelt. Yes or no? Number two, President Truman. Number three, third strike. Number four, time. Number five, Harper's Magazine. Number six, life. Number seven, star. Star. Yeah, you know what I mean, star. Number eight, face. She said, is that a magazine? <laughs> she wasn't here yesterday. <laughs> Some of you may not think in the back of your mind that you didn't learn a lot yesterday, but I have a hunch that you learned more than you realized. There's a different way of evaluating or responding compared to those who did not hear the lecture yesterday. I can feel it. I can see it in your ways of response. And sometimes it's just on the, in the subconscious level, which is where it should be, the neurological level of behavior. All right. Number eight is face. Number nine, glass. Number ten, Ford. Ford. Number eleven, Lincoln. Number 12, Washington. Number 13, Elliot Roosevelt. Number 14, Franklin Roosevelt. Number 15, Jack Benny. Number 16, Rochester. Number 17, Lucky Strike. Number 18, Cigarette. And number 19, Camel. All right. Now, let me just ask you, uh, what would you think of the following individuals? And would you raise your hands on this? Because I want to write uh, some of your answers on the blackboard. What would you think of the following individual? A student at the university listed the following reasons for not joining a sorority. Number one, I don't like the thought of having to spend my evenings with a bunch of girls. Two, I don't want a lot of fraternity men calling me up at night. Three, I've never danced with a man in my life, and I don't want to. Four, I don't like the idea of having to room with the same girl all semester. Five, I don't fill out a sweater and don't look very attractive in a sleeveless, low-cut gown. What are some words that we use in describing this kind of a person? What's that? Inferiority complex. I knew you'd say that. That's why I didn't call on you. <laughs> What's that? Insecure. What else? What's that? Timid. Timid. Afraid. What was that? A wet blanket. <laughs> what? Negative. She? She feels superior? All right. And number six, I am a man. That's why I didn't want to ask you. How many of you assume that it was a woman? Some of you? All right. Notice this is why we have misunderstandings. And this is what we will be concerned with. 
All right, let's go back to the little quiz. Number one, how many of you had yes for President Roosevelt? Hands? Okay. Uh, who did I mean, President Roosevelt? You had yes, right? I could be referring to either Franklin or Teddy, right? So you don't know, right? Or what? Could be a ship also. But let's say that maybe this would be 50, 50 percent, right? Assuming we're talking about presence of the United States. Now notice I'm now introducing the assumptions of probability. But if you assume that I meant Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and you were sure, that's the assumption of certainty, right? And this is precisely why we have misunderstandings. This is what we are talking about now. Basically, we call this projection, projection and misunderstanding. All right. Now, remember the importance of orienting your life in terms of probability, not certainty. Because the moment you are too certain, this is when you have problems. When we are too certain, we don't ask questions. We jump to conclusions. We have misunderstandings. We have the allness orientation. And these, of course, are all interrelated. Okay. So, therefore, number one should be what? Yes or no? No. All right. Number two, how many of you had yes for number two? All right. And how many of you had no? All right. We had more with the yeses. Number two is President Truman. What's that? Did you have no? Okay. Now, technically, you are right. Could be President Truman of the D. Malay in Pittsburgh or Philadelphia or something, right? In fact, technically, all of these would be no. Technically. But we don't want to be that technical. But if need be, sometimes we have to get that technical. Isn't that true? But would the probability be higher for President Truman than President Roosevelt? Okay, something like 90% maybe, right? That we're referring to Harry S. Truman. All right, let's go to number three. How many of you had yes for number three? Now, notice quite a few of you have yes. Number three was third strike. What did I mean by third strike? Baseball? No, I was thinking of that third cold strike in 1943. Very disastrous to the economy of our country at that time. How many of you had no for number three? Okay. Now, if those of you who had no were talking to those of you who had yes, you would have misunderstandings, right? This is the nature of language, as we will see. Number four, how many of you had yes for number four? Time. How many of you had no? Notice what is happening. Did some of you start around question four or five to have more no's than yeses? Okay, this means that you were starting to learn. <laughs> and why do I have these little quizzes? so that you will show yourself wherein you have misunderstandings. Number four was time. Do you know what I mean by time? No, no, I was thinking of four o'clock. I'm asking you, do you know what I mean when I say? And this is why we have misunderstandings. When you are communicating with someone else, you know that you know what you mean, <laughs> right? But do you know what they mean? In other words, can you get on their channel of communication? Basically, this is what we are talking about. Here we have the speaker speaking with his meaning. Let's call this A. And you have the listener listening with his or her meaning B. They are bypassing each other. This is called projection or bypassing. 
And when you assumed that I meant such and such, you were wrongly projecting your meaning into my words. Right? So by projection or bypassing, I mean when the listener wrongly projects his or her meanings into the speaker's words. And this is why we have misunderstandings. And why do we do it? Is the signal reaction principle involved in misunderstandings? You bet it is. Is jumping to conclusions involved in misunderstandings? Yes, it is. Is the allness orientation involved in misunderstandings? Yes, it is. But if you have a non-allness orientation, you won't misunderstand. You will ask the person, what do you mean? Because it's the easiest thing in the world to have misunderstandings. Uh, let me show you what I mean. Here's an eraser, a piece of chalk, right? What is this? And what is this? Okay. Give me a directive, and I bet I could go all the way around the room and misunderstand anything you tell me to do. Anyone at all? What's that? Right on the board. Is this what you want me to do? No, I'm sorry. I misunderstood you. <laughs> Give me a directive that I cannot possibly misunderstand. Do what? Identify the item. That's too ambiguous. <laughs> I don't even understand you. Yes. On the front of the board. All right. What do you want me to write? Anything? No, you said with a chalk in my hand. <laughs> Give me a directive that I cannot possibly misunderstand. Yes. Drop the chalk in your right hand on your right foot. <laughs> well, I lost it. First, let me drop the chalk in my right hand. Is that what you meant? No, no, he said drop the chalk in your right hand on your right foot. In other words, first you want me to drop the chalk in my right hand. Well, that isn't what you meant. Give... <laughs> Give me a directive that I cannot misunderstand. Yes. Erase the word misunderstanding on the blackboard. Oh, with the er I didn't hear you say with the eraser. Oh, you told her. No, no, you're talking to me. Give me a directive that I cannot possibly misunderstand. That's the easiest thing in the world. Now, if your directives, this is what we call by such an ambiguous directive, and what you're saying is right, when you say do anything you want, no matter what I did is what, what you didn't say, really. You're not communicating any information. Huh? Yeah. And this is why we have misunderstandings, because too many of our directives are that ambiguous, right? This is all I'm pointing out. What I'm doing now is only a semantic exercise, a scientific illustration to show you how easy it is to have misunderstandings. And you can give a directive that you may think is specific and concrete, and for some reason or another, it will be misinterpreted. Give me a directive that I cannot possibly misunderstand. What are the variables involved in effective communication? Yes. <laughs> Swallow the chalk. Well, that's a little kinder than some that I get.
At this stage, some of the guys say, drop dead. <laughs> Once at the University of Chicago, we'd lecture from 4.30 to 6, and we'd go out to dinner from 6 to 7, then come back at 7 o'clock and lecture from 8.30. And I would give the fellows one hour, their business, uh, dinner time, to think of a specific directive that I cannot possibly misunderstand. And we came back at 7 o'clock, and uh, I said, well, if you fellows... Uh, found a specific directive that I cannot possibly misunderstand. And there's an executive sitting right up in the front, and he, he raised his hand. And he said, yes, I have. And I said, okay, give me a directive that I cannot possibly misunderstand. He had an eraser behind him, got up, threw it at my head, and said, duck. <laughs> I did not misunderstand. <laughs> All right, let's get at it, and I won't pursue it too far. But I'm merely trying to point out to you, it's the easiest thing in the world to have misunderstandings. And so much time, money, energy is wasted because of ineffective communication. And most of what you do on the job is communication. Give me a directive that I cannot possibly misunderstand. Stop whatever you are doing. Give me a specific directive that I cannot misunderstand. I misunderstood that one. Yes. All right, that's pretty specific. Is this what you want me to do? Oh, I misunderstood you. I'm sorry. Give me a directive that I cannot possibly misunderstand. Yes. Eat the chalk. Eat the chalk. <laughs> Same thing as swallow the chalk. I didn't do it when he asked me to. Why? Yes. What's that? Sit down, please. <laughs> now, the please wouldn't do it. <laughs> you don't have to be that kind. What's that? Sit down. Now, if this were longer, I would go sit in her lap. <laughs> oh, you didn't mean that. Why am I not doing what you are telling me? Seemingly, you have been specific and concrete, more so than you were at the beginning, right? But there are still some variables missing of why I'm not doing what you want me to do. When did you want me to do it? Oh, now. Oh, I see. Is it important to say when? Yeah. Yes, it is. And what I'm showing you here is that there are so tremendously many variables involved in effective communication. Einstein has said, until you include the fourth dimension of time, you are not specific. You are not concrete. All right? All I have been doing is showing you how easy it is to have misunderstandings. Very quickly, let's go over the rest of some of the rest of these. Number four was time. Do you know what I mean by time? No, that's ambiguous. Number five, Harper's Magazine. Yes or no? Who says yes? Quite a few of you. All right? Especially the women. What do I mean by Harper's Magazine? A magazine? To read? Okay. Actually, I was in the service in the Air Force with a fellow named Harper. He was a machine gunner. And we used to talk about Harper's Magazine. An Air Force officer gave me that one at the Traffic Institute. Would the probability be higher that it refers to the magazine that you read? Okay, I will buy that. Number six, life. Yes or no? No. Number seven, star. No. Number eight, face. No. Number nine, glass. Anyone say yes for nine? Why did you say yes? Couldn't think of any other? Window glass? It's not the same as the drinking glass? Eyeglass? 
That's further qualifying. I was really thinking of Senator Glass. <laughs> Can you ever be certain that you know what someone else means? No. And this is what we are pointing out now. But misunderstandings come about when we assume, when we falsely assume that other people mean what we would mean if we were doing the talking. Number 10, Ford. Number 11, Lincoln. Number 12, Washington. Number 13, Elliot Roosevelt. Probability goes up. Number 14, Franklin Roosevelt. Could be either senior or junior, right? Number 15, Jack Benny. Probability goes up. Number 16, Rochester. No. Could be the valet, which is the way I structured it to make you assume I meant the valet when I really was referring to Rochester, Minnesota, where the Mayo Clinic is. New York. No, I was talking about Minnesota. <laughs> Number 17, Lucky Strike. Number 18, cigarette. Now, this is truly an ambiguity, right? Those of you who say yes, you are probably referring to a little object that looks something like this that you smoke. Those of you who say no, I did not say what kind of cigarette. Right? Okay, yes. You have a friend with a horn, horse, horse named... Cigarette, all right. I know a fellow with a horse named Michael Dean. <laughs> okay. So, to some of you, and he's been winning lately. <laughs> okay. Now, what are some of the things involved with language and language usage? Let's briefly talk about language or language usage. And what have we learned about this little quiz? What have we learned about this little quiz? Words have, Words have multiple meanings, or let us call this the ambiguity of language. Words are ambiguous. They can mean many, many different things. Why do I spend this time making you conscious of this fact? Because too many of us assume we are brought up in only one language, and we assume that a word has only one meaning. Whose meaning? Our meaning. And this cannot be emphasized enough, because again, we are taught in high school that words have meaning, that meanings are in words. And as I told you yesterday, the general semanticist has a different answer for this kind of a problem. Okay, remember number one, the ambiguity of language. Words are ambiguous. They can mean many, many different things. The word line, for example, may refer to straight line on a paper, surname, Keep on the line, white line on the pavement, line up, stand in line, course or direction, line of goods, what's my line, radio network, telephone, hold the line, battle line, equator, date line, deadline, short letter, line of verse, outline, same old line, hold that line, football, finishing line, fishing line, tow line, skyline, shoreline, clothesline, hemline, line of garment, design or good line, ancestral line, line one's purse, lifeline, draw the line, say no. We could go on indefinitely. The small dictionaries will have maybe one or two or three definitions. The large dictionaries will have 30, 40, or 50 different definitions for the same word. So remember, number one, to become conscious of the ambiguity of language. The second thing is, become conscious of the fact that we learn the meanings of words from our past experiences. This is how you learn the, quotes meanings of words. You learn them from your past experience. And as all of us have different experiences, don't be surprised if you have different meanings for the same word. 
and especially those of you who are doing business with people who are in other businesses. You may have the same word, but a completely different meaning. But if we are afflicted with allness again, if we assume that we know what other people mean when we don't, that's when you have problems. That's when you have misunderstandings. That's when your company may, it may cost you several thousand dollars by going off and doing a job which they did not want you to do or because of this misunderstanding. For example, a lady ordered some stationery. This seems like a very simple one. And in business and dealing with printers, we have misunderstandings com continually with them. And you'd think that more businesses would send their men to some communication classes. Am I right? Are there a lot of communication failures? Does it cost you time, money, and energy? You bet it does. And I'm amazed that our schools of business, our industrial relations centers, do not teach courses in communication. If they have a course in communication, there are two kinds of courses. Number one, either in public speaking or number two, in letter writing. But I am talking about everyday human communication. And you know, when I left the University of Chicago's Industrial Relations Center, they did not find a teacher in the whole Chicago area to take over my communication course. And yet this was one of the basic courses in our management seminars there. Ninety percent of what the executive or businessman does is communication. This is the heart of business and industry. This is the heart of coordination in business and industry. And if you don't have coordination and cooperation, you are going to have a tremendously disjuncted organization. Only through effective communication can you have effective coordination. And you only have men working with men, of course, in business and industry. All right, so number two, we learn the meanings of words from our past experience. Is this man using words correctly? While examining an inductee, an army medic noticed a scar on the boy's scalp, and he asked about it. I got it from being drugged, said the inductee. The doctor, failing to see the connection, asked him to elaborate. Well, the inductee said, I was working on a ranch, my horse bolted, my foot got caught in the stirrup, and I was drugged. <laughs>